two. So area study one was all about thermodynamics. Area study two is all about electricity. And there's technically two chapters. The first chapter is modeling electricity. And to be honest with you, it's just understanding the basics. What is electricity? How do we measure it? What is a circuit? Blah, blah, blah. Um, what is current voltage and so on and so forth. Aries topic four is specifically about circuits. Now, if you guys, for those of you that did the, um, did my course, uh, engineering maths, this will probably be very similar, very easy. Um, those of you who didn't, this will be a bit different. You may not be familiar with some of the things, but that's okay. We're going to build up, build up to where we get to. So lesson 22, that's this lesson here. My main goal is to talk about um, how an item becomes charged. We're going to talk about what makes something charged. And we're also going to do what happens once it is charged. So these are some things, interactions you probably learned about all the way back when you're in grade six. It's probably basic stuff you, you know and love. But I'm going to talk about, I guess, in a bit more of a VCE context so that we can maybe use this later on to explain things. Let's jump forward and we'll keep going. So I wanted to start off with some basics here. You don't need me to know this, but I love starting off in history because then it gives you guys a background about where this stuff came from. Um, in ancient Greece and possibly other parts of the world, it was found that rubbing amber on fur um, after rubbing amber and fur, they were able to take on, amber was able to take on magical qualities. And I say magical, and I know that sounds a bit wanky, but that's exactly what they, they didn't, couldn't explain it. Uh, it could move metal needles without even touching it. Um, of course, they didn't have metal needles back then. It would probably move, you know, tiny feathers, tiny bits of pollen and grass without even touching it. And of course, if you can move something without touching it, that's pretty magic back then. The word for amber in Greek uh, was electron, which is kind of, it was like, okay. And so when referring to these amber qualities, they would call them electric effects. They would sometimes use them as K, but yeah. So that's essentially where the word electron comes from. It means amber. Um, so of course, in this picture over here, we've got a big piece of amber and we've got a piece of wool. So that's the first time that, um, I can't spell wool. That's the first time that we sort of, no, I, I could, I just gave myself, you know, we'll go with fur. So that's the first time we sort of see the idea of what, am, what electricity can do. Now, what I'm going to do with you guys now is I'm going to sort of talk about why this is the case and what happens when you, you know, rub a piece of amber or plastic. In this case, amber is acting like, I guess, a bit of a, um, is acting almost like plastic. It's a polymer. It's pretty much made out of carbon. It's got, yeah, it's got a lot of carbon. It's probably the ancient form of plastic, essentially. You could melt it and use it. And so when we talk about plastic rods in this next slide, well, let's, yeah, we're going to talk about this stuff. Before we get there, though, let's grab a, let's zoom in. And yeah, check out those effects. It took me a long time, by the way. Let's zoom in on the basics of um, electricity and what makes something charged. So we sort of know this, that protons are positively charged and electrons are negatively charged. We've talked about protons and electrons since um, year eight, pretty much. Year seven, year eight, we talk about the atom. So you guys should be pretty comfortable with that. We know that these um, opposite charges attract each other. This is what keeps the electrons near the nucleus. We know that this electron is attracted. Oh, I lost my um, thing. We know that this electron is attached, attracted to the protons, and that's why these guys stay near the um, near the nucleus. They don't go into the nucleus because they're um, moving around the nucleus so rapidly that they just don't actually go towards the nucleus. And there are other quantum reasons why electrons don't fall into the nucleus. But essentially, they are still attracted to the nucleus. The more protons you have, the more attraction there is. Um, we know these basic things. Like charges repel each other. The nucleus um, 
the nucleus has the neutrons, which provide a buffer to stop the positive protons repelling each other. Because technically, if I take two protons, because they're like charges, they should repel each other, which they do. The only reason why the nucleus of an atom isn't exploding every second is because they've got these buffer neutrons, which sort of, you know, stop them from pushing too much. Electrons do the same thing, because if I take two electrons, they'll repel each other. That's why whenever we draw these diagrams, you put these electrons as far apart as possible, because they would try to repel each other. And that's actually gives us a really good way to understand things. Of course, if I take two unlike charges or two different charges, they will attract. Um, protons can't move. So when I, whenever I talk about these, I say, I'm going to talk about the nucleus as these big things that just can't move around very easily. So when we're discussing the movement of charge, the move, we're usually discussing the movement of electrons. We don't fire protons around, we usually just fire electrons. Um, so let's sort of, um, am I going too quickly or is that okay? Does everyone get that basically at the start? Yes, no, so you this in chat, okay, yes, okay, good, yep, beautiful, all right. Let's um, keep going then. If, I, if you need me to stop because I'm going too quickly, just say so. So the next part is to then look at something over here. We're gonna look at this thing and we're gonna look at this thing. At the top, we've got a plastic rod. At the bottom, we've got some wool, very similar to the fur and the amber situation here. If you want, you can count all of the protons down the bottom and all the electrons, and you should find that this is a neutral charge. So is the top one. There is no extra electrons anywhere. They're just the same amount of charge. But what happens if I take this wool and I, you know, rub it against the, um, the rod? So I just, you know, rub, I rub the wool against the rod, and you guys have seen people do these in, um, experiments what's going to happen is the electrons in the rod are going to move onto the wool now i had to remake this whole powerpoint because i got it the wrong way around but now i'm pretty confident the idea is the electrons move onto the wall and i like to sort of think about it almost like okay think about the wool is like a big sort of like brush like a big sort of sweep, like, um, yeah, it's like a big sort of mop or brush, and it's mopping up all the electrons. It's sort of, because it's got all these dangly fibers that can come along and get rid of the electrons. That's why it's important to use something like plastic, because it's got lots of, um, it can hold a charge. What happens when this happens is that you can now see, we count there is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven protons. Okay, so if we've got seven protons, but we've only got three electrons, so we've got a positive charge. And the reason we have a positive charge is not because we've gained protons, it's because we've lost electrons. Okay, now remember, whenever we talk about gaining charge, whether it be gaining a positive charge or gaining a negative charge, it's either because we've lost electrons or gained electrons. Technically, you could achieve the same charge if you gain protons, but because protons are so big and they're part of the nucleus, they just don't move. So what are we going to do with this positive charge? We've got a positive charge in a rod. Of course, that does mean that the wool that we just lost, let me go back a second, this wool has a negative charge, it has more electrons, and it could be used in a similar sort of way, but we're just going to focus on the rod. And the rod does a really good job of maintaining this charge. What do we do with the rod? Um, before we talk about that, let's talk about some static electricity now. So static electricity, this is an example of static electricity. Static means not moving. So static electricity is a permanent charge. Static, of course, comes from the word stationary, not moving. The charge is built up and it stays on the rod. The electrons are free to move. Uh, the electrons are free to move from the plastic 
to the wool, leaving an overall positive charge on the plastic. Now, electrons, as I said, they can move pretty easily, so that's why they jump there. The wool now has more electrons uh, than protons, and so it's a negative charge. So we've got these two static charges. And we know we've all experienced static electricity. We've all accidentally, you know, touched the doorknob after, um, after rubbing our feet on carpet and actually got shocked. So static electricity shouldn't be something that is new. Um, but let's keep going. What happens if I take a small piece of paper? If I take a small piece of paper or a feather or a piece of pollen, what's gonna happen is, is that it's got protons and electrons, but it sees this overall positive charge. And it has electrons that are gonna be attracted to that negative charge. In fact, other electrons like these ones down here, might even move into that paper. In such a way, they would go into the paper, making it even more negatively charged, and then the paper would get attracted. Okay, so this, is called, this process is something called induction. What we're doing is we're creating a charge in an object, in this case, in the paper, without even touching it. The paper overall becomes negatively charged and becomes attracted to the rod. Um, this overall positive charge in the rod attracts electrons in the paper. In the paper, the protons can't move, so electrons from the floor move into the paper. The charges are different, so the paper is attracted to the rod. Okay, if um, so, this is what draws the um, paper to the rod. Initially, the paper wouldn't get drawn to the rod, but because it's touching something which has electrons, the electrons can move to the paper and jump up. And then you can, they would then get attracted, and then yeah. The more things that get attracted to that rod, the less charge the rod has. So this is what we call induction. What else can we do with our rod? What are some classic other experiments? Ah, are there any questions? If you have any questions, throw them in the chat. I got a question. No? Nothing? Okay. So. Um, let's take this rod. And let's now move the rod over here and we'll bring in our next experiment. We've got a tap here. Now you guys have probably seen this experiment before. You let the tap go in a very, very thin stream of water. But because there's a charged rod here, the same effect can be seen with a stream of water. This effect is the electrostatic force and it actually changes the direction of the stream. Suddenly now, the stream is being pulled to the right. You might say, well, why is it getting pulled to the right? Why is it getting repelled? Well, we can look at this again. By bringing the positively charged rod near the water, the stream is pulled towards the rod. What causes that? Well, if I zoom in here, I can see the water molecules all have negative charges and positive charges. And again, the negative charge is going to be attracted to the positive rod. And so it's going to pull the force is going to pull it closer. Again, this is an idea of induction. Okay, it will, other electrons in the water, other electrons in the water may also jump into this charge to pull it further that way. Um, and again, this is an idea of induction. We're, in, we're creating a charge in the water droplets. Um, and that's what pulls it towards the rod. These electrons are attracted to the rod, and so the stream moves. Um, sorry, go back here. And the stream moves to the right. Um, if the rod was negatively charged, it would still, and this is the part that's a bit trippy, if the rod was negatively charged, the electrons would still, the uh, stream would still get pulled towards the rod because this, that way, the, they, the 
the um, electrons would leave the area, making it positively charged, and then they would get pulled. Essentially, induction always leads to two things coming together because um, you always induce the opposite charge. In this case, the positive rod makes a, the water more negative. And if the rod was like, if we had a negative rod, what would happen is the stream would have all the um, electrons would go away. And then you would end up with an overall positive charge in the water and that would attract it. So it all, induction always makes a, um, a charge that's opposite. And that's what moves the stream. Let's talk about one more example here. We're going to talk about, well, how does this interact with different charges? Let's bring in this here and this here. On the left, if I, oh man, my cute little animation didn't work here. On the left, we've got this sort of rod here. This has got more electrons. This is more electrons than protons. So this has a negative charge. Whereas this guy has more protons than electrons, or we could say it has less electrons um, because it's lost electrons somehow so that's got a positive charge so what happens when these two charges interact with the positively charged rod we see that the negative charged mass and the positively charged rod are unlike so they become attracted Positive gets attracted, oh sorry, negative gets attracted to positive. Whereas in this situation, the positive, the positive charge moves away from the other positive charge. And so that's why it swings in the opposite direction. They repel. And this is exactly what I talked about when we talked about the protons at the very, very start. So I guess what we let's quick recap of the quick the three main things we talked about. Um, we've still got some time. We've still got about uh, ten minutes left. So quick recap. Firstly, you can induce a charge. You can create a charge by moving electrons, like actually ripping electrons off something using a piece of wool or a piece of. Um, you can do it using paper towel or whatever. And they will move on to a brag or whatever, leaving an overall positive charge and a negative charge on the wall. That overall positive charge can induce charges in other things like paper. Um, and then the next thing, okay, I've got 10 minutes left. And then, um, and then the other part would be the after something's been you can then also induce a charge in water and that will bring the water stream closer to the rod and we've said that of course if it was a negatively charged it would still induce the opposite charge and then last but not least i said that opposite charges attract and like charges repel just like what we did at the start okay now there is a way to build up a charge in a very, very fast way, not using this method that I've talked about. And that would be using a Van de Graaff generator. And what a Van de Graaff generator does, it actually uses, instead of using wool to sweep electrons off, it actually uses, uses a charged comb to sweep electrons off. And that creates a positively charged piece of rubber. That positively charged piece of rubber goes over the top, and then those positively charged air, those positively charged plastic will rip off electrons from the um, from the top metal bowl. What that's going to mean is is that the overall charge on the top is going to be positive, um, and that's going to lead to a big positive charge here, 
And of course, that's going to mean that there is going to be a big negative charge here. And you can actually start to get sparks. Sparks would occur when electrons jump from the negatively charged area to the positively charged area. Man, I'm making a mess. Okay, so, and that's of course because of the static builder. Um, and I think, yeah, that's it. That's all I wanted to go through with you guys today. Um, we've only got about, let's have a look. Um, how much time have I got left? I've got about, about eight minutes left. Um, but yeah, I'm not going to go through. Um, so the questions that I set for you guys to work on deal with this idea of positive charge and negative charge. And we can sort of talk about this stuff and you guys can sort of now see why we sort of did this stuff. Um, I did want to maybe finish up on, um, for example, I might finish up on this idea, these two ideas here really quickly, but I don't think I'll have too much time to go through it. I've got about a little bit less than five minutes. I wanted to talk about electrical conductors versus electrical insulator. So what are they and what does it mean? So an electrical conductor, and this is really interesting because we've just finished talking about thermodynamics or about thermal conductors, and they are usually the same thing. An electrical conductor is something that allows electrons to move quite easily. Electrical conductors um, have charge carriers that can move. Charge carriers is being like is like the code for usually electrons. It's got lots of electrons that can move. Metals are good conductors because they have lots of electrons that can move. But salt water is good because it has moving ions. Sorry guys, I think my dogs have found a the mailman. Moving ions, or like in this case, so NaCl, don't have You might say, okay, but that doesn't have any electrons, that doesn't have moving charge, but it does have ions. And ions also count as charged particle carriers. These are charged carriers too. But because they're good, because they're really good, and this is the last sort of idea that I really want to get through, especially if we're running out of time, because they're really good at carrying charge. They're really bad at creating static electricity. If I had a metal rod and I was rubbing a metal rod with a piece of wood, wool, nothing would happen because it'll just, um, oi, shush, dogs, hey, sorry. Um, if I rub a metal rod, it'll, it will just lose all the electrons straight away because it moves the electrons around. Whereas a plastic rod, That'd be a bit different. A plastic rod is instead an insulator. Materials that don't allow for charge carriers to move are electrical insulated. Air and other gases are insulated because the charged particles are so far apart. We know that from our particle theory. Charges are so far apart that there would be no way for electrons to move. Wood and plastic and skin are also good insulators because they don't have any free moving electrons. This means if these substances gain a charge, then instead of that charge moving around because, of a, because it's a good conductor, they will stay there. Hence static electricity. That's why in that example, I said it was a plastic rod because I wanted you guys to realize that a plastic rod can hold that charge for a long time. Whereas a, um, whereas something like, you know, maybe a, um, a metal rod would lose it because it would conduct the electrons. The electrons would get conducted away quite easily. So skin, that's why when you touch things, you get shocked because skin can hold the static charge for a while until it touches something that can conduct those electrons away, like a metal handle or a metal door. So that's why the 
different materials are important. Pure water is also an insulator. There's no charged ions in pure water. So in theory, if you had 100% pure water and you put like electricity through it, you could stick, you, it wouldn't conduct. You could stick your hand into it. But the second you stick stuck your hand into pure water with a, your, it would make a salt solution because you've got salt on your hands and then you would die. So overall, and I've got about two minutes left, I'm going to stop there. Um, I'm going to then 